we're going to be in Jonah today. Jonah is one of the most unusual, but really the most theological books in the Old Testament as far as the startling statement of God's love for Gentiles. Jonah is so different from all of the other minor prophets. And because of that, there has been much discussion. Is this an allegory or a parable or typology? But because Jesus quotes this quite often in the Gospels, I really think it's historical narrative. Jesus quotes it Matthew 12, 39 and 40, 16, 4, and Luke 11, 29. So I think it's an actual occurrence, a real man named Jonah and a real uh, preaching mission to Nineveh. Now, the dates for Jonah are somewhat ambiguous. Uh, I've got a graphic I want to show you. We can, we can walk through what we at least know about Nineveh. Uh, Nineveh is the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Um, at this point, we're not sure if it was obvious that they were going to be the power that takes the northern ten tribes captive, although Jonah is mentioned in the reign of Jeroboam II, who is the last major king of the northern ten tribes, and his reign was 783 to 743 B.C., and you can see it in 2 Kings 14.25. Some possible internal dating factors was there was a real trend toward monotheism in the reign of Adad Nirari III, 810 to 870, uh, or 783 B.C. There was also a major plague during the reign of Asherdan, 771 through 754 B.C., which might have been the setting. Now, Nineveh, we know, was destroyed by Babylon in 612 B.C., so it had to be earlier than that. Exactly what the time element is, we're just not certain, just not sure at all. Now, let's look at the book then itself. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. Now, the word Jonah means dove, and this is where some get it's a parable, meaning the nation of Israel, which is symbolized by a dove. The son of Amtai. Now, this is a very rare term, just like Jonah is. They only appear one other place in the Bible, and that's in that passage in 2 Kings 14.25. Arise and go. These are both imperatives in Hebrew. They're commands. Nineveh. Now, Nineveh is a name for Ishtar. Uh, this city was located on the Tigris River. The ruins are about a mile away, and here's a picture of those ruins. Uh, it was a powerful city, large city, uh, that lasted for a long period of time. Now, notice if you would, uh, the great city and cry against it. Now, this same word cry is used then in verse 6 where the captain of the boat is going to say, call on your God. It's the very same term. Uh, against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now, we learn from the cuneiform tablets that have been discovered archaeologically of the cruelty of this nation. There is no crueler nation that we've ever had on record. What it did, to pr it skinned prisoners, it put hooks in their mouths, it did everything imaginable, these captured people. And I think that's probably what the wickedness is being referred to. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish. He thought maybe he'd get away geographically. There's been much discussion about did the Jews feel like that God was a God of Sinai only or a storm God? Is that why they went after Baal, the fertility God? I think all of that is just pure baloney. I don't think Jonah really thought he could flee from God. He just was trying to run like all of us do, uh, far enough and fast enough that God would just say, forget it, fella. But God is going to work with this prophet that's rebelling just like God's going to work with rebellious people, the Assyrians that do not know him. Now, when it says Tarshish, Tarshish is one of those cities that there's been much speculation about. Now, here's a graphic I want to show you. It's mentioned in Genesis chapter 10, verse 4. Traditionally, it's been put in southern Spain. But new archaeological evidence seems to point toward the island of Sardinia. Uh, W.F. Albright, in studying on Sardinia, found the term used for smelter, and he thinks it's Sardinia too. Now, Snath thinks it refers to the mystical city at the far end of the earth. Uh, we would call it the far country, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, I'm not real sure which one of those it is. Tarshish. From the presence of the Lord. You might want well to see Psalms 139, 7 through 12. So he went down to Joppa. Uh, that's modern Tel Aviv. Um, it's a coastal town. It's the only natural coast 
on the uh, Mediterranean coastline of Palestine and found a ship. Uh, now, boy, that's, that's irony because Jews just don't get on ships. They are not a seafaring people. They want to stay on land. And so Jonah getting on a ship, probably a sign of how desperate he was, that was going to Tarsus. He paid his fare. Now, the Masoretic text says he paid her fare. So the Jews uh, say, the interpreters, that Jonah was a wealthy man because he rented the whole ship just for himself. Now, the Septuagint says his fare, and that probably is accurate, okay? And went down into it. Now, we learn from archaeological uh, cuneiform tablets again that the Phoenician ships had two decks with 30 to 50 rowers. Then it had a third half deck. So apparently Jonah went down into the deepest hole of the ship, probably where the cargo was, and went to sleep. Um, and the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so the ship was about to break up. This was no normal storm. And these seasoned sailors knew that and became afraid. And the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God. Here's the kind of like modern eclectic religion. Uh, if you get in trouble, call to any God you can name. Maybe one of them will help you out. That's kind of the way these sailors were doing. Um, so the captain, excuse me, but Jonah had gone below in the whole of the ship and laid down and fallen asleep. Isn't this irony? It's about The ship's about to sink. He's about to die. And here's the prophet of God sleeping in the whole of the ship. Uh, so the captain approached him and said, How is it that you are sleeping? Get up and call upon your God. Now the word call is the same as in verse 2. I bet Jonah, waking out of his sleep, thought God was talking to him again. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us and we will not perish. And here's that eclectic approach. When in, any, in a storm, any port, well, that's what these guys were doing with their religious nature. You know, we found sociologists and anthropologists tell us that every known culture we have found is basically religious. And I think that goes back personally to Genesis 1 and 2 where every man is made in God's image. It may be marred, they may be fallen, but they still have a longing search for God. Man is incurably religious. Now, Verse 7, And each man said to his mate, Come, let us cast lots, so that we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. Now this casting of lots is an unusual thing. It's very common in the Near East. And notice that God is going to answer these lots, even though it was done by pagan people. I've got a graphic I'd like to show you about the casting of lots. It was a way of knowing God's will. Now, we're not exactly sure how it was done. Here are some possibilities. There was several rocks of one color and one rock of another color. There were two rocks on which yes or no were written. Some say it was like a Scrabble game with uh, lots of alphabet in there. Now, we know this was also practiced by the Jews. In Exodus 28:30, that's the Urim and the Thummim of the high priest. In Joshua 7:14, that's the casting of lots for who sinned at the destruction of Jericho. Uh, we have an account in 1 Samuel 14:40 uh, through 42, and then Acts 1:26 is the lots that were cast to replace Judas. Uh, uh, with the apostle. Now, notice if you would, where it mentions here, uh, and they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, Who are you? <laughs> they start asking all kinds of questions, this guy. Tell us now, on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? Boy, Jonah knew he was pegged. And so he said to them, I am a Hebrew. Now, this is a term we think is an Akkadian root. Uh, I believe it's spelled H-A-R-I-R-U. And it means one who crosses a boundary. So it means foreigners or, or sojourners, maybe. This is the term that Hebrews use to describe themselves to other peoples. And I fear the Lord. Now, notice that word is all caps. Whenever it's all caps in your Bible, it refers to the covenant name for God, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, from the Hebrew verb to be, Exodus 3.14. It's the covenant name, the God or El of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Now here is Jonah's theological confession of faith of monotheism. It'd be much like the Shema of Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5 and 6. And the men became extremely frightened, and they said to him, How could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. You know, the sailors here come across much more spiritual, much more religious than does Jonah, the prophet of God. And that's the author's purpose. Here is a rebellious, backslidden prophet who knows God but doesn't care about people. Here is pagans who do not know God but who have greater compassion for Jonah than Jonah does for a whole city 
of people. The sailors are the ones who come across in this passage much more like the nature of God. Now, um, verse 11. So they said to him, What should we do that the sea become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. They had thrown over all the cargo, they had lightened the ship, and they were still about to sink. Look at verse 12. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea, and the sea will become calm to you. There have been several theories about this. Is this self-martyrdom, him giving himself as a sacrifice to save these men? Knowing Jonah, the way he's predicting this book, no, that is not what it is. Maybe this was Jonah's ultimate escapism. He's saying, well, if I can't make it to Tarshish, I'll just die, and then I won't have to go preach to Nineveh. <laughs> Our third, maybe he realized that the penalty for rebellion was death, and she, he had just reconciled him to the self that God was going to take his life. Well, whatever the reason, uh, notice first the, the uh, nobility of these men in verse 13. However, the men rode desperately to return to land, but they could not. They tried to save Jonah. Before they were willing to throw him in, in, in the sea, they rode as hard as is physically possible to get that man to shore, but they couldn't. Um, and they called, look at verse 14. They, me and the pagan Phoenician sailors, called on the Lord. Now, Jonas just mentioned his name back over here in verse 9. The word Yahweh is mentioned three times in verse 14 in these pagan people's prayer. They are calling on God from sincere hearts more than the prophet is calling on God. Isn't that amazing? We earnestly pray, O oh Lord, do not let uh, us perish on account of this man's life. And do not put innocent blood on us. Now, innocent blood is the concept of taking someone's life. Remember how Abel's blood cried from the ground unto God? You might want to see Deuteronomy 21.8 and Matthew 27, 24, and 25 for this Hebrew concept of innocent blood. Now, so they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. And the men feared the Lord greatly, Yahweh. I guess they did. The storm coming up was miraculous and fiercer than those seasoned sailors expected. Number two, when they, the lots fell on Jonah and they heard who he was and why he came, boy, they were afraid. And then when they threw him in the ocean and the ocean's calm, they knew they were dealing with a supernatural element. And I'm sure it did upset them and frighten them. Now, verse 17 in the Masoretic text is the first verse of chapter 2. And here's the consequences of Jonah's folly. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. Now appointed. This was not a special creation or a special fish. God used an existing fish to swallow Jonah. Now friends, I believe in a supernatural God. If I believe that God can cause the storm and God can cause the lots to fall on Jonah and God can cause the storm to stop when Jonah's thawing the water, I have no problem at all that a fish can swallow Jonah and he can stay alive three days. Now this whole discussion about was it a shark or a whale or a whatever, I don't know and I don't care. I just believe that a fish swallowed Jonah and I bet it was awful yucky in the belly of a fish. <laughs> and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Now, in the New Testament, this is used as an example of Jesus being in the grave three days. Now, I don't think that is taught here, but I think Jesus, looking back in Matthew 12, 40, wanted a cryptic reference to his own resurrection in three days, and he quotes this. But I don't think the people that heard him understood it, and I don't think the disciples understood it until they looked back. Maybe when Jesus was talking to them in the upper room or the two on the road to Emmaus, maybe he went back and covered this. I just don't know. Uh, God shows love for a rebellious prophet. He could have got someone else, but he was going to work with this man the way he's going to love those Assyrians and work with them. Now, in chapter 2, it's a poem. It's a poem. As, as the prophet is sinking down in the water, he's going to, to uh, give a, a, a psalm of praise to God. And that's his psalm. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish. I think I'd start praying myself in the stomach of the fish. And he said, I called out to my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. Now, this is the most positive psalm you can imagine from a guy who's in the belly of a fish who's been swallowed because he was running from God. And he has no doubt God's going to get him out. 
No doubt at all. Now he says, and he answered me, I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. Now a little more literally, it's the belly of Sheol. Sheol is often personified as an animal eating uh, large uh, numbers of people. Sheol is synonymous to the Greek term Hades, and it was the holding place of the dead. It was, rabbinical theology says, it was split into two halves, paradise for the righteous and Tartarus for the wicked. Remember when Jesus said to that thief on the cross, today you'll be in paradise? Now, friends, he wasn't going back to heaven for three days. He was talking about Sheol. Now, I, I've done a tape that I think is really interesting called Where Did Jesus Go the Three Days in the Grave? And it deals with the four biblical words about the holding place of the dead. Sheol, often called the pit or the grave, Hades, Tartarus, and Gehenna. And I hope you'll send for that tape. I think it'd be interesting to you. Where did Jesus go while he was in the grave? Now, Sheol in the Old Testament is considered to be in the ground. The etymology of this word is somewhat in dispute. Some think it comes to ask, either people asking to talk to the dead or the grave asking for more people. But some think it comes from the, the root hollow, which means a hollow cavern under the earth. Now, I get so tickled at people who say, well, the Bible's just made up. It's, it's anti-scientific. The Bible is not anti-scientific. The Bible is pre-scientific. It is written in the language of description. Let me ask you a question. What do you do with your dead people? You put them in the ground. Well, guess where the ancients thought the dead lived? In the ground. It's as simple as that. You, in your scientific culture, said the sun rose. Now, you know the sun didn't rose, rise, <laughs> blew that verb. Uh, the trick is, if you want to be accurate, you'd say, oh, what a beautiful earth rotation, but you don't. How about when you say the dew fell? Dew doesn't fall. See, even in our scientific day, we talk in the language of description. That's exactly what the Old Testament is, the language of description. It's not anti-scientific, it's pre-scientific. That's very important. Now, uh, verse 3. Thou did cast me into the deep. Now, there are several allusions here. I don't know if you mark up your Bible like this. I, I use colored pens. Uh, if you can see all the yellow on there. Yeah, I think you can. I'll move it up a little bit. See all the yellow and pink and blue? All that yellow is on references to the ocean. He's going to sink down into the seaweeds. The billows are going to overflow him. Uh, he's really dealing with these water metaphors as he's in the belly of that fish. And I can sure understand that. The breakers and billows pass over me. But notice in verse 4, uh, he talked about the temple. He says, I've been expelled from thy sight, which means he's been set up, cut off from the temple. Nevertheless, I will look again toward thy holy temple. He's got faith that his eyes are going to see that temple again. Just like Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives, and with my eyes I'll see him on the earth. Boy, Job got the same kind of faith. He says, I may be in the belly of a fish now, but I'm going to see that temple again. I'm going to pray again. I'm going to be in God's presence again. Boy, he's positive. I want to tell you. Notice in verse 5, the water overcompassed me, the great deep engulfed me. This great deep is the Hebrew term related to the Akkadian term, a Tiamat. Now, Tiamat is personified in the Gilgamesh epic, which is the Babylonian creation account. It usually means the primeval ocean. Genesis 1-1 would be the Tiamat, the primeval ocean. Uh, Genesis 1-2 is where it is. But in the Bible does not personify it and use it in the mystical sense of the Babylonian creation account. Now, notice again in verse 6, it mentions the root of the mountains. Well, the Hebrew cosmology was that all of the earth floated on the water. And so the mountains of the sea would be what held the, the earth up. You say, oh, that's a good example. The Bible's just fairy tales. Wait a minute, friend. Wait a minute. Let me ask you a question. If you go start digging holes around... What do you find? Well, if you're lucky, you find oil. But if you don't, you find water. It may be fresh water. It may be salt water. So the ancients believe that the earth flowed on water. Now, it's just the language of description. It has nothing to do with science. That's what it's saying here. Now, notice in verse 6, the term from the pit. Now, that's used quite often as a synonym for Sheol, okay? The pit. In verse 7, he says, I'm going to pray to you again into the holy temple. And notice in verse 9, he's going to sacrifice again. This guy believes God's going to get him out of the bed of this fish. He really believes he's going to be back in Jerusalem. Uh, I bet when that, in verse 10, when that fish vomited him up on the land, he didn't head for Jerusalem first. Guess where he headed to? Whoop, Nineveh. <laughs> 
He didn't want to get back in that fish again. You can bet that. So here we have a prayer of thanksgiving and deliverance before he's ever delivered. Um, and I'm sure Jonah went back and worshiped and sacrificed and paid his vow of praise. But he's going to do that task he didn't want to do because God's trying to show him that God loves all people. Friends, I'd rather, I'd rather worship with these sailors than I had this Hebrew prophet. These sailors come across a lot better folks than this Hebrew prophet. And that's chapters 1 and 2 of Jonah. Next week, we're going to be covering 3 and 4. And I'd like to ask you a favor. I'd like for you to read it ahead of time and write out the central idea or the topical sentence for every paragraph in chapters 3 and 4. And I'm going to include a worksheet with these two lessons for you to do that. Put the topical sentence in your own words, write in one sentence, whatever paragraph means. And I think when you see the central truth of the book of Jonah, it's going to surprise you as an Old Testament book. I think it's one of the greatest affirmations of the love and mercy and long-suffering patience of God of any book in all the Bible. This Hebrew prophet is one who just seems to always, always stick his foot in his mouth. And I can certainly relate to that. There are a couple of very good commentaries that I think if you're going to deal with the book of Jonah, you might want to see if you have them available to you. A good set on the Old Testament is the New International Commentary Series. And Jonah has a volume. And it is detailed. It is excellent. It is good exegesis. It's excellent application. And of all, I like that whole series, both in the New Testament and the Old Testament. If you're looking for a good commentary series, it's not complete yet, but they're working on it, and it's an excellent, excellent commentary series. Now, I usually don't recommend the Broadman commentary because I think it's usually lousy in the Old Testament, uh, but this one on Jonah is pretty good, and I think it, it's volume 7, and it'll be very helpful to you, and those are the two that I recommend. So I hope you'll get one of those. When you're studying the Bible, if you don't pray about it before you come to the Bible, if you don't write these questions out in your own words before you let other men's opinions influence you, I think you're going to be led astray or at least led down their paths and not let the Holy Spirit work through you. But after you've done all you can in praying and looking up parallel passages and writing the topical sentence, it's important we go to other men who God has spoken through. There have been some great Christians who've walked before us who've left us some help to understand the Bible. We ought to look at those. And the real key is, I hope as we study Jonah, that it's going to impact the way you live and not just let you understand a little more academically about one of these minor prophets. God wants to change the way you look at people by studying the book of Jonah. He wants you to see people made in his image that he died for. Now, we may not have Assyrians and Hebrews today, but we got folks who don't look like us, smell like us, talk like us, act like us. But God loves them just as much as he loves you. I've enjoyed being with you. I'll see you again same time, same place next week. God bless you.